now even more people are leveled up. There's barrack. What's this? Spire rest bonus. Plus five to all skills. Oh. That must be a bonus that happens if you've recently been on the spire. Alright, so Barrack needs a level up. We'll start with him first, because we have an idea of what he is. Don't know what to do with new character necessarily yet. Uh, we will get to that. Go for a little bit more health this time. Okay, what do I want to put points into for you this time? So going through our options here. We have Defender's Watch, an allied AoE passive. Uh, minus 5% all damage taken for 3 seconds. That's not bad. It's not a big bonus, but it's something. Uh, we have Sound of War. Uh, modifier of Clash of Iron. So you already have Clash of Iron here. That's the wrong one. So we have Clash of Iron right here, which taunts people. Uh, for 6.4 seconds. That's pretty straightforward. Then we have the modifier that you can strike twice after using it. Then you can also get the modifier where nearby allies get two bonus armor for 20 seconds within 10 meters, which is a decent size radius. And it's always good to have bonuses in general. There's seasoned veteran, it's a one, two, and uh, just two. There's no three down here anywhere. Unless they're down here now. Which let you uh, engage more enemies. And I think I want to get that next, but first, this really catches my attention. Shield wall, plus 40% shield effectiveness. Seems kind of like a big deal. But there's even a Phalanx 2 down here, with even more armor. Cool. But yeah, that seems like that bonus to shields would be a big deal. Like a real big deal. Alright, a little progress here. Stirring Visions. Whatever you did at the Ascension Hall in Vendrian's Well has given you the power to interact with the Spire. Before you ascend to the Spire, you had a vision when the Edict broke. Understanding this vision might help you better grasp this new, this new power you've acquired. And it wants me to interact with the Spire device. We'll learn about that. Made progress, apparently, with the Vendrian Guard. Ha. <laughs> yeah, that Wrath is way up there. All the way up to rank 4 now. It's almost as if we, you know, obliterated them. Uh, unnerving Presence. Uh, ooh. Foe AoE, what does that mean? Must, oh, must, must mean, I assume it's an AoE around my character that affects foes. 3 meter radius, minus 4 accuracy. Neat. So I have a three second pulse that reduces the accuracy of nearby foes just all the time. That's not bad for a passive. If I get to rank five, I will gain, gain uh, drain strength. Uh, reduce resolve, finesse, and might of enemies. I have to use it manually though as a cone. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> you you killed a Vendrian guard soldier 64 times. <laughs> kind of a big deal. Alright. Spire upgrades. This one's new. Alright. Mountain Spire, Vendrian's Well. Mysterious device. The ancient device perched atop the Mountain Spire, Vendrian's Well, is the product of a forgotten age. It is unclear what function it once had, or if it can be used again. Resting in any spire grants a bonus to all skills. So there must be other bases you can get over time? Ooh, look at all these things down here. Revos, a merchant. Uh, with a motley collection of items for sale, Revos will create camping supplies periodically. You can hire them for 10 bronze rings. I have 32, but is it a... Is it overall... Co does it cost more periodically, or is that permanent? Satis uh, teaches unarmed attacks, parry, dodge, and subterfuge. Isolan, one-handed weapons, parry, and athletics. Swordbreaker, two into weapons, thrown weapons, dodge athletics. Oh, that's obviously the one I want. Also, he's cheap, apparently, but those are exactly the things that I specialize in. Thrown, dodge, and athletics. Corpse Eye. A battlefield scavenger with many unique items for sale. Neat. Tanera. A skill trainer teaches one-handed, two-handed, thrown, parry, dodge. Oh. So thrown definitely shows up from time to time. This one comes with parry and dodge, whereas this one comes with dodge and athletics. So this one might be... It comes down to if I want to focus on athletics or dodge for my particular character. This one clearly helps with more characters in my party, though. Potentially. Uh, Kenrick. Uh, regularly produces weapons. And Lone Fang. An old beast woman who regularly provides food to take into battle. Well, these are neat. And some of them are kind of expensive. Might as well experiment, right? Uh, what's this here? Spire management and edicts. Select a region to view the current information about its current edict. So you can look at edicts here. Currently there's none, but apparently those are going to come back. 
Good to know. Let's check to see if there's a major Spire tutorial coming up here. Oh, companion combos improved even more. The power you gained by ending Karis' Edict on Vengeance Well can be channeled to your combo abilities with your companions. All of your combos have grown more powerful as a result. Perhaps you'll discover additional ways to make use of their powers as you adventure through the tiers. What does more powerful mean exactly? Wait. Oh, right. Versus isn't in my party, so the uh, knock people down combo's not there right now. But Iron Storm, that looks like a big circle. Ooh, Quicken. What made, what made this better exactly? Once per encounter... I'm not entirely sure. It seems like it might be bigger. Does it... Wait, does it have AoE or something to it? Oh, it's, it has an allied AoE that heals everyone in the entire area. I don't think it did that before. Now it's, that's a really big deal as far as heals go. Damn. Just briefly looking for... There we go. Spire. You have acquired your first spire. That removes any ambiguity about whether or not there's going to be more. This spire will be your home base as you adventure through the lands of Kairos' tears. Your spire gives you a free location to rest and recover from your travels. As you acquire more spires, you will discover additional functionality. Click on the spire icon to open your base in, uh, home base interface or press H. I definitely want to learn about upgrades. Oh, dismiss companions. Once a character has been dismissed from the party, they will return to either to the war camp or the spire if you've unlocked it. That's definitely happened already. You received a missive. Missives are short messages carried by birds between distant parts of Kairos' empire. That's pretty straightforward. Let's check in on how disengagement, disengagement attacks work, because we've been dealing with them. I've just been assuming they work like attacks of opportunity, which is probably true. Uh, one of your party members has been hit with a disengagement attack. A disengagement attack occurs when one character is engaging in another character in combat, and the person they are engaging with tries to move away. Be careful how your parties move. Party members work, move on the battlefield and avoid receiving disengagement attacks. So it's absolutely an attack of opportunity. In D&D, if, if, if you have somebody in your attack range and they try to move around and leave, for example, they try to, they try to enter and then leave your attack range, then you get a free attack on them, basically. It's a punishment for it's it, it, it's it's what it's what forces characters to kind of lock together, because uh, you you'll see that fights turn into a lot of one-on-one -on -one fights and one-on-two -on -two fights and stuff like that. Uh, if it wasn't for engagement mechanics, somebody could just run away whenever they felt like it and just stop taking part in the fight, <laughs> and just leave freely. Instead, it's only only like special rogue abilities let you do that without a straight-up penalty. We have four attribute points to spend on Ebb. Let's see what Ebb starts off with right now. Ebb has Repelling Blast. Does Frost Damage versus Dodge. Creates a powerful jet of water that strikes a nearby target and knocks them back. So it immobilizes and pushes. Phantom Bolt. It is... an 8. It attacks at a range of 8 meters. Uh, strike a target with a bolt of Grave Light Energy that drains health from the target and converts it to the... Uh, to health for the caster. Ooh. So it damages and, and heals the cast. It damages the enemy and heals the caster simultaneously if it's effective. Electric Jolt. Electrocute the target with a huge bolt of entwining lightning, dealing shock damage and stunning them. Nice. So she could be a good addition then, because she could be an offensive caster while the other party member is a defensive caster. Which may be a good reason to, rem to remove his offensive... Uh, Maybe remove uh, Rhyme Spike altogether and just focus on all these things like Titan's Touch and Spectral Blur. And things that fit into the... Uh, into Illusion, I think it's called, or... Dis or yeah, Illusion, Vigor, and uh, Restoration. Or Life Magic, I mean. Light of the Grave. Combo ability with that, he does, that she does with Guy. Surrounds the party with a glow of grave light energy. While affected, the party's attacks will transfer health from enemies. Oh. Neat. Uh, range of 4 meters, so it's not a very big AoE. Yeah, it's not, it's not a huge area. But if it hits people for 30 seconds, people get 30% life leech, which is kind of a big deal, actually. That's neat. Gives her a surprisingly defensive cast to go with all of her relatively offensive spells otherwise. Yeah, with... With that, I think it's okay to go ahead and remove... 
Rhyme Spike. It's removed from you. Maybe assign it to you instead. I can't. Oh, I created a version of it that has too much stuff on it. That's fine, we'll get we'll get back to her other spell options in a moment. Let's look into talents to figure out what she's like. So she has two tiers called Tidal and Gravelight. What is Gravelight? Arcane Missile. Sends a charged bolt of arcane energy at a foe that bounces to hit nearby enemies. So kind of like Chain Lightning-ish. Uh, Teratus's Call. Lift the target into the air and violently throw them back down to the ground, dealing crushing damage. That's kind of fun. The way at the bottom we've got uh, Teratus's Gate. That uses Gravelight to teleport across the, ba the battlefield. Enemies near her cast and destination locations are hit with a Gravelight attack that drains health. So it seems to be this vague, some kind of vague concept of a... Uh, almost like, un like death magic crossed with arcane magic or something. Has elements of like fear and life leech and arcane and stuff like that. Whereas Tidal seems to be water bending, basically. So she starts off with a repelling blast. Create a powerful jet of water that strikes nearby a target and knocks them back. Which sounds like fun. Start blasting people with jets of water. So she gets four points to spend, and that's the only thing she comes with built in. So I could, even if I want to, disregard Tidal and just make, make her a Gravelight Mage, despite her being introduced as being a water based spellcaster. So there's a bonus to frost damage dealt, bonus to shock and frost damage dealt. Larger AoE, larger bonus to shock and frost damage dealt. Okay, so she becomes a shot. She she gets two elements in here apparently, or so it seemed. I don't see anything else that necessarily sounds like shock immediately. What's at the bottom of this tree? Repelling Nova, powerful Nova of water that repels all enemies, pushing them back a further distance, or fair distance. So she has a lot of knockback with this tree. It, you probably really interrupt and mess with people with this. Summon a globe of water to surround the target's head, leaving them to slowly drown. You put an enemy in th 30 seconds of drowning status, which causes raw damage over time and prevents spellcasting. Wow. That's pretty neat. So if there's an enemy spellcaster, assuming that they're able to get, them, get to hit them in the first place, which might be possible because apparently it's versus endurance, which is not exactly a spellcaster stat all the time, necessarily you'd be able to stop them from spellcasting and drown them. <laughs> Probably wouldn't actually kill them, but that's a, a fun trick. I think I do want to deal with the water powers. It just feels weird to skip on that. I just want to look a little bit about what kind of tricks we have here. Purifying water. Conjure enchanting water to wash over targets, removing all the hostile effects. Neat. Student of magic, 10% magic staff damage. 20% magic staff damage. 30% magic staff damage. That's straightforward enough. Return to the source. It looks like a one minute cooldown later in the tree. Summons water from the target's blood and tissue. It then erupts out of them with a surge, dealing massive damage to the pro- That's horrifying. <laughs> so she does, uh, she essentially does anti-elemental attacks. Like, at attacks that go past anybody's actual elemental resistances and are just raw. I mean, this is some Magneto nonsense, where it's like, you've been having a lot of iron in your diet lately, kaboom! Person explodes, kind of. That's horrifying. Yeah, let's give it a go. So, bonus to frost damage dealt. Just go ahead and grab the passive right away. Now I can buy one of these, and I'll have access to the next tree immediately. So just be careful here. Reduce hostile afflictions to 80% of their duration. So I can make all bad things last 20% less time. Or go for Mother's Embrace, Summon a Global Water. Yeah, I, I, I do like that one a lot. <laughs> I do like the idea of that quite a bit. Alright, now we're in the next tier. So I can go 10% frost, Shock and Frost damage. So I think that means that the Frost is essentially staying at the same percentage, because the other ones go higher uh, when you get to them. So this I, I assume that Frost is still staying at 10%, but now Shock also gets 10%. But I don't necessarily have a anything to use yet that is frost elemental. So that's the purifying one. Repelling wave, it's a cone of knockback with some frost, there's the frost damage. But it, I don't know if I have shock damage yet though. Passive. Uh, clear mind, when Eb is not taking damage her recovery time is reduced and she strikes twice with her normal attacks. Being hit removes this bonus for a few seconds, wow. 
Wow, so if she's not getting attention, she can attack twice as often. Huh. Wait. It says attack twice the normal attacks, but the status... No, yeah. So you get you simultaneously get less recovery time and you strike twice. That's kind of a big deal. That sounds awfully neat. Let's grab that. And maybe repelling wave next. Unless I want to do damage with staves. Just as a passive. Yeah, that could that would stack well with, with clear mind. Let's see how she does. She she, she could be an inter interesting character. Alright, now she has some points established. Let's look at what she's using right now. There's her weapon. She has. She's not really wearing very much equipment right now. So we probably put some light equipment on her. She's wearing cloth, so I probably I'm probably supposed to stick with cloth if I want to keep make her keep going uh, acting fast at the very least. Uh, wow, that's a name to try to read. Sis <laughs> Siz Sizigi. I think I'm gonna go with Sizigi. <laughs> Two-handed common weapon does arcane damage. Uh, attack is based on magic staff and control grave light stats. Only Eb can equip this. Freezing. On weapon crit. Uh, frozen. Uh, enemies frozen for six seconds if it, if it works out. Eb's staff, Sizigi, uh, is a fearsome specimen of the modern Tidecaster staff. A bladed polearm with a much more martial, intimidating construction than the humble and handcraft wooden staves that the first Tidecasters repurposed from sailing oars. Festooned about the haft are et etchings of celestial dance between the sun, Teratus, and the moons. So she could be a very suitable DPS replacement for Verse, potentially. But we won't know until we're in action what kind of... how she'll work a lot of the time. So she currently has Tidecasters gloves, which seem pretty not interesting. Meanwhile, there's these liberating hand wraps that give her one more precision, and three unarmed, D oh, unarmed DPS is uh, not as interesting. But the precision's there, that's good, and comes with a stat unbound immunity to paralyzed. So I see no reason not to equip these. Put these in the stash. Staff of Boreal Frost does... Almost three more DPS and 1.6 seconds less recovery is pretty neat. And it does frost damage, which she currently gets a bonus from. Yeah, all damage dealt is increased by 10%. So this should do more damage. The downside, of course, is I lose the freezing stat. And I lose the other... what was the other bonus? It's mostly the freezing stat, actually, in this case, right? Her, so their, their recovery is 2.5. This thing's recovery is 0 0.5. So it really just comes down to whether or not I think the freezing effect is going to happen constantly or if I just want to go with nice rapid attack. This thing says its DPS is 4.82. Yeah, the, the DPS bonus kind of seems like it's kind of huge, actually. I may want to switch. Oops. Stash you away for now. Does that have an estimated value? 17. I'll hold on to that. I might I might learn to regret changing. But it seems like, based on raw numbers, this would be better, aside from maybe the freezing effect being very effective or something. Don't really know yet. So you're mostly wearing cloth still too, right? Yeah, you are. So, unless this is good for you, it's not. We should stash it. Then this is a leather item. Uh, it is not easy to balance the idea of armor versus deflection necessarily. I think the armor is worth it, though. That's, uh, that's a flat three difference in damage. Similarly, I think the Sun Soldier's shield might be better than Disfavored. I don't know, I made a few equipment changes and it sure kind of felt like it resulted in certain characters living longer than they were before. <laughs> so it's not a terrible idea. Alright, that's a bit of maintenance done. Just need to pick stats for her now. So she may be a bit of a more close-up type of character. Why is everything green right now, by the way? Oh, Spire Rest Bonus. Yeah, that won't make my stats at all confusing. 
So this weapon, of course, is modified by Control Frost and Magic Staff. I think Control Frost is a good thing to prioritize raising up, which... Really? So Tide Casting is here, but not Control Frost. So she actually doesn't have a Control Frost skill that's established yet, but Tide Casting should affect all of her primary skills, I believe. Tide Casting, Tide Casting, Magic Staff. Passive. So things that increase tide casting are good fits. And so it's probably a good idea to go for wits and might. Might also helps because she's going to be probably attacking. So this is co control by magic staff stat. And the magic staff is where? It's right here. It's only affected by wits. Okay, so the staff is not affected by might at all. So. Really, this is going to be the go-to stat to pump up. I might just put four points into it right now. And see how that goes. It's a big bonus to magic staff. It's a bonus to tide casting. Okay. This is worth noticing, though, that tide casting gets more of a bonus from might, which is 1.5 multiplier, and wits is only a 0.5 multiplier. Whereas magic staff, wits is a 1.5, and finesse is a 0.5. So if I want to increase tide casting, uh, might is actually more important. And if I want to increase magic, then wits is more important. So there's a real reason to split between the two. So I think I will. This will be an interesting experiment. All right. Have fun, Eb. You now work for the enemy. So I hope you feel real good about yourself, I guess. <laughs> Maybe we should have a nice chat with her. She's the newbie. Right, we gotta do that down here. What? Oh. It's, okay. <laughs> I thought it was saying her name was not Ebb for a second there. I'm like, what? So it's specifically telling me that I have failed to achieve loyalty, loyalty level 1 with Ebb. So she's maybe doesn't want to talk to me. Eb clears her throat as you approach, eyeing you head to toe. With her arms folded, her right hand plays with the knots and ties of cord wrapped around her left forearm. So if I might ask, what is your plan now? The edict no longer looms overhead, and Kairos's conquest of the tears seems to be slipping. What with the armies in civil war? First order of business, I should speak with Tunan. I would counsel you to do just that. I'm sure the events of Vendrian's Well are best explained from your mouth to Tunan's ears. Furthermore, I'd guess the Archon of Justice would want to know your take on the Archons and their divide. You know, maybe I can win a little favor with her. I'm improvising. Any suggestions? My first suggestion would be to build a boat. Something durable, and take our chances on the high seas far from Kairos. Your water bias is showing. I have a second and more practical suggestion. Look to the horizon and slightly up. By that I mean the other spires. We should see what's atop the others. Otherwise someone else might look first. Oh, do other people not own spires? I guess people were surprised by being up here, but I kind of thought for a moment that maybe all the other spires were owned by other Archons or something, but maybe not. Judging by this circle here, maybe there's a whole bunch of spires too. Uh, maybe even that many spires? Maybe they even point in those directions? Now that would, that's probably a ring on all of them, so they probably don't all point in those directions. Uh, interesting. I kind of thought that maybe the voices of Narat had their own spire and stuff like that. I get, I'm, I'm betting that getting every spire has a big impact, like it might be a doomsday situation, because they often are. I don't suppose you've heard of others awakening the spires like I did. Queens and kings of past ages have claimed the spires in the sense of, Hey, look, I put up a scaffold and hung a banner a tenth of the height of a spire. But that's nowhere near the same thing as what we all just saw. She did a voice. That's oddly endearing. So I say, let's see if the other spires react to you the same way this one does. If we don't, I'll take that as your way of saying you suffer from debilitating acrophobia.
My goal is to defeat the disfavored. I fought the disfavored and know all too well their skill and tenacity. Destroying the disfavored, though, where to start? Killing Graven Ash would of course be the goal, but he's a mighty warrior in his own right, and he's never far from his legion. We could try to counsel with the enemy of our enemy. No doubt the voices of Nerat would be eager to destroy Graven Ash, but I'm not sure if consorting with the Archon of Secrets is wise. Worst case scenario is that uh, he tries to eat us and take our secrets. Okay, that's pretty bad. I will crush the remaining op lo local opposition and complete the conquest. I see. I'm sure there's little I can do to persuade you otherwise. Just consider that the people of the Tears will someday bow to Kairos. Why not have them bow to you instead? That's all I have for now. Well, short of Tunon giving you orders on pain of death, you have the luxury of acting on your own volition. Though the disfavored are likely to come for you. Whatever you decide, I'm at your disposal. Have a moment, let's speak further. What is it you need? I have some questions for you. Ask away. Tell me of yourself. What would you like to know? Tell me about your name. Well, I was born Hazen Levengia, but for most of my name, m most of my life, and I suppose all the days after, I am known and will be known as Ebb. Tidecaster Ebb for those trying to be obsequious. I've also probably used a bunch of aliases that are going to haunt me at some point. How'd you get the nickname? I'm one of those not especially... Uh, it's not one of those... It's one of those especially... Uh, just fuck it up every time. <laughs> it's one of those not especially funny jokes that stuck long past its season. I wrote the road ebb incorrectly in a, in a written examination. Master Folovax started calling me ebb from then on. He claimed it fit me. Said I, I was a cynical little shit that always sees the ebb, never the flow. I can kind of get that from the dialogue we got we started earlier. Hazen, didn't realize you were nobility. I know, I dress myself and cook my own food. So misleading. Mother was a magistrate of Ardent. Father was Admiralty. It's mostly meaningless, though. Our lands are now the Overlords. Did you always want to be a Tidecaster? So when I was a little girl, what I really wanted to be was a Marine. The burly bitch at the brow of the tr of the wow, these words are not taking it easy on me at all. At all, the burly bitch at the prow of a tr of a trireme. Trireme. I have. I don't know. Trireme, maybe. Probably trireme. First to crack some skulls with, when the ships rammed. You know, an honest living. Fortunately, the uh, school sought me out before I got myself killed at sea. I, I, I imagine a trireme might be a type of ship, actually. I was thinking of, t of parts of ships, but it might be a type of ship. The School of Tides was looking for new blood, and my father was an admiral of Haven, so the school wanted me for the political connections. I got to speed my, uh, I got to spend my first couple years providing, uh, proving I actually belong with the Tidecasters. That was fun. So this is reference to the part of, uh, the part of the, the realms where uh, one gender gets to rule all the land, and one gender gets to rule the sea, which is a strange division. What did you do for the in the years before the war? Survived? Doesn't matter what I did. The people are gone. The places have new names. I'm just trying to stay focused on what's currently t uh, taking me now, or where the current's taking me now. We need more reputation for that one. Which I think I have zero still. Yeah. Good good amount of fear though. How'd you fall in with the Vendrian Guard? What does it matter now they're gone? They seem the last hope for the tears, and an any sh shitting fuck of a chance is still more than no chance at all. Well, that didn't amount to much. Let's speak of magic. You know, I normally charge for this, but for you... Eb smiles, awaiting your query. What can you tell me of the Bane? What I know is largely taken from Master Camberil's work and some near-fatal experience ventured, venturing close to the old walls. At best, as best I understand it, the Banes are bits of magical will that have an extended life of their own. 
I am of the belief that they nest or reproduce in the old walls, the only place you regularly find them. Our magic attracts the bane. That much I know to be true firsthand. Again, this is personal theory, but I'm guessing they eat or drink magic, so our spells are invitations to dine. What can you tell me of, of your magical uh, tradition? Now, you know that's a very personal question. The knowledge I have is a centuries-old gift from the Archon of Tides. I would sooner discard my life than the sanctity of that gift. I will speak in generalities only. Ask. Worst, worst I can do is not tell you. Tell me how you influence ice, mist, and other forms of water. With years of training... With years of training, now look. Most of those secrets have already been stolen ages ago by the sages. Doesn't mean I'm going to tell you just because the secret's already out, but it means you can go ask someone else if you really feel so entitled to know. Maybe even this guy over here. <laughs> he might know. Oh, there he is. <laughs> and before you ask, I've learned plenty. I've learned plenty of knowledge. I've learned plenty from knowledge stolen by the sages. But no, I don't know how uh, how to do what Ep does, uh, magically or otherwise. Oh, okay. There you go. There we go. Then. Can you teach me what you know? I suppose I am capable of it, but no. The secrets of the Archon of Tides, Tides dies with me. Occulted Jade, Archon of Tides, is the founder of the School of Tides, as well as its only ruler. Though she wore the title Archon, Occulted Jade never bowed to Kairos, though many have tried to compel her to do so. Having arrived with the settlers that made landfall of the Five Wives, she is perhaps the oldest known living tearsman. Capable of manipulating the oceans, the moons, and all the transitory forms of water. Occulta Jade used her magic to form a cabal of seafaring traders, musicians, and academ academ ac academic. I've never seen. I've never seen it. I, I would always just. I've only ever heard people say it academics, not academicians. That's. <laughs> never heard anyone do that. All right, fine. And it was the dedication to the arts that helped the school endure. For by teaching these trades to the children of noble families, the school remained in the good graces of the realms. Being able to control most anything cyclical and fluid, occulted jade has lived for centuries and could still be alive today. But none know this for cert uh, with certainty. In the years before the conquest, the School of Tides discovered the Overlord's plan to invade. Despite all assumptions that the, that the Tears resident Archon would be would defend her school and home. To the surprise of everyone, the Archon vanished across the seas, taking nearly the entire School of Tides with her into exile across uncharted waters. I can, I can command her, but I don't think that's going to work. Tell me how you influenced Teret's grave. That is a trade secret, or at least was a trade secret up until a few years ago. My masters were taken before voices of Narat, and he pried that wisdom from their minds. Not that I'm bitter. Uh, not that I'm still bitter. So the voice of Narad gets to know, but I don't know. That, that doesn't seem like a good idea, especially if we ever face them. What are the phil uh, philosophical teachings of your magic? There's a question I can answer. It would surprise you uh, little to learn that we see all things, people, wars, seasons, to be cyclical, waxing and waning, though their various form, uh, through their various forms like the tides and the light of Teratus' grave. Teratus, the planet, uh, has two satellites visible by naked eye. The tide locked uh, Teratus' grave and the rapidly orbiting interloper. Scholars have long studied the effects of these two moons and the, on the ocean's currents, and great deal of folklore concerns the origins of the moons. A common belief in, in Kairos' empire is that Teratus' grave will finally set on the horizon when Kairos' rule ends. Whereas those of the, uh, of the tears insist the moons are older than the old walls and will outlive even Kairos. It's probably true, because they're moons. But don't tell anybody. <laughs> the mind is limited. We're born and spend our lives dodging death. We expect all stories to have a beginning and an end. We assume all things start and stop just like us. In truth, all things are cycles. Some by matter of minutes, other by matters of years or lifetimes. In the School of Tides, we appreciate patterns of all sorts. Most are called to the depths, others find their interests skybound. 
many still uh, still find the tides of human emotion and political fortunes far more intriguing than inanimate tides found in the orbits of oceans. From what archons did the Tidemaster draw upon their magic? The first Tidecasters were given the gift of magic by our school's founder, a culted jade archon of tides. Though she was not Kairos's ilk, she was as powerful as any archon, and from her name and legacy, we can mimic the moon's pull of the seas and change the currents. Teratus, the planet, has two satellites. That's the same... Yep, that's the same one we saw before. And it's from her that we have spells to turn the moon's pleasant hues into a baleful ray of searing grave light. Interesting. So this arc, this vaguely, like, undead arcane magic we're hearing about is specifically moonlight powers is where it's supposed to be the basis of that. In all these years, I have not grown tired of the thrill of power in a rush of carnal humors every day, every time. I'm not surprised by the fact by the fact that the moon rays apparently have a weird magic that has a duality to its function, because it just reflects the weird way that like the same stats can help both mages and rogues and like things like that. Like a lot of the a lot of the stats in this game seem to be about duality, which fits all the more that the game is about two opposing forces, and even on your side of the forces, uh, under under uh, for under under this conquest, there's even within that team two opposing forces. And all the stats do two f do two, two different functions, and so many different things are just split in so many different ways between two things, to the point where the planet has two moons of all things. I'm guessing you can tell me more than I ever wanted to, kn to know about the moons. You'd be right. My magic is generally associated with the moon Teratus grave, but you have to know where Interloper is in the sky when mucking about with mystic forces. That's just the same line of dialogue again. Oh, I can use my lore. Do you control water, or do you mimic the tidal effects the moons have on water? Both, actually. I'm amused you're keen on the difference. Our spells of ice and mist affect water directly, but are of limited volume. Displacing your own body weight in water is, is no mean feat. But if you moved an, an ocean current... If you were to move an ocean current, I, I'd, I'd drive myself nuts moving water in front of a boat a little at a time. That's where I'd use a, a cantrip to stimulate the tidal pull. Teratus Grave's the big one, right? Tell me about it. Teratus Grave is fixed in the sky, always overhead, day and night. It was first named by folks living far to the east. They'd look to the west and see a moon like a permanent hill on the horizon. A grave where the sun dies each morning. That's how other folks, uh, that's how other folks saw, oh, older folks. That's how older folks saw it. If you live in the western part of the world, Teratus Grave is overheard overhead all the time. This means all day and night, it's reflecting the sun's rays. And if you know what you're doing, it doesn't just reflect, it magnifies. Interloper's the one that moves in the sky, if I remember my lessons correctly. Exactly. Interloper uh, orbits Teratus at a steady clip, and its orbit sometimes it, uh, crosses with in front of Teratus Grave, leaving leading to mystical calamity if you don't know what you're doing. Have you heard anything from the Tidecasters that left before the war? No, and I don't like entertaining the hope. Those cowards are all gone. If they didn't die at sea, they're dead to me. I reserve the right to be pleasantly surprised if they come back, eager, eager to fight the good fight, but I'm not holding my breath. All the brave Tidecasters died. Present company accepted. Alright. Part of me is admittedly pressing to see if I can make if I get any favor with her to press her past any of the stuff that she won't talk about. Not working so far. <laughs> Fine, we can talk about other arcane matters. You know, I normally charge for this, but for you. Do you know anything about the magic of the Archons? Enough to know that I'm out of my element, that is to say, I've studied the many Archons a great deal, and I have a great number of hypotheses and conjectures, but, well, I'm no expert yet. And like most who have invoked the Archons of time, the Archons of times past to work magic, I do wonder what difference of birth or experience gives one the magical potential to be an Archon. Most of my studies have been into the question of origins, of form, it's known we can emulate the magic of Archons that came before us, but it is possible to tap into the magic of Archons yet to be? So far, 
The answer seems to be no. She looks at the ground with a rumpled smirk. Why are you smirking? Are you on the edge of something? Are you figuring something out? <laughs> Do you know anything about the old walls and spires? Not enough. Never enough. Eb smiles, twirling her staff in her hands. As a child, I was terrified of the old walls. I thought... I, I think that's true of most folk. Now that I can arc grave light with a wiggle of my fingers, well, I think when I'm a shriveled old hag, dying in the old walls would be a great way to go. Gravelight is a magical term for the light of the moon of Teratus' grave, specifically when harnessed and manipulated for nefarious purposes. While the moon's rays are normally incapable of causing so much as a mild sunburn, the Tidecasters have long studied magic and can concentrate these rays into bolts and beams of seared doom, searing doom. The Tidecasters have spent centuries trying to mimic and control the moon's tidal pull on the oceans and will often mention the diverting of moonlight as is the easy stuff compared to pulling and pushing of the tides. But modern times have forced School of Tides to concentrate on this more martial application of this magic. So that's interesting. So this entire school of people that benefit specifically from moon magic, and that's made possible by the fact that no matter what time of day it is, there's always a moon directly overhead. Ask away. And that's very different. Alright, we can definitely keep pressing for her more, but that'll have to be for another time. This is, uh, you can talk to your party members for a very long time if you want to. I feel like we've barely even started. All right. Why don't we take a look around? Because there's this thing over here. Wait, actually, there's still the issue of spell... Ca Wait, do I have access to them from here? No, these are all different things. Biography and sec... Wow. The game is nothing if not detailed, right? All right. So do I have any new spells? Spell types, we have Force, Life, Frost, Illusion, Vigor. I may be able to teach her a useful Frost spell that she may not have already. So she has a lore of 52, which is not extraordinary, so I have to be a little careful how far I try to go with this. She currently has Electric Jolt and Phantom Bolt. That's a Health Drain, and that's an Electricity Attack. There's the Shock Attack. So it'd be a good idea to give her a Frost spell because she already has Frost Modifiers. So I can go for Fire Frost? No, I can't. That's already too much for her. So I can either take the ranged or close range attack. Frozen Grasp. She may benefit from having close range attacks. Let's see. Range of 1 meter? No, radius of 1 meter. Range of 8 meters. Range of 8 meters. So right now she has ranged attacks. Maybe I should switch the, with a ranged one then. So she has a shock. I can give her a Frost one. Maybe increase its intensity. 27 to 42 Frost, and she does have the lower skill for that. Good. And regardless of what kind of spellcaster she is, it's probably a good idea to give her the ability to heal herself. Because I think that's just going to help everybody. Can I do both of you? So I can increase range and strength simultaneously if I want to. You just need to have the sheer amount of lore for it, which is not always easy. But I think having access to a heal is going to be worthwhile, even if she's not great at healing. It seems like everyone would benefit from that. Let's see, Force. Just reminding myself, this is co covered by... Was the governing thing? Control Force. Maybe Force should not be her specialty. Let's, let's, let's leave Force for my main character. She can do Frost and she can do... Uh, yeah, she has Frost and she has Shock. She has enough elements already, I think. Instead, I can give her a close-range copy of Frost, just to add to the pile. Can we get away with this one? Ooh, Frostfire. It gives her access to a whole new element. There we go. She can't afford enough. Yeah, everything... This stuff's way too ex expensive right now. Okay, so now she has a Shock spell, a Life Drain spell, a Frost spell, a Frostfire spell, and a Heal. Seems like a good mix. If I want more spells, though, I'm going to have to increase the slots, which I can do. But only via this guy's tree down here. Arbiter of Knowledge. Two more spell slots. Is there a... I don't, I don't think there's a higher version, unfortunately. I think you have to stop at two. But that's still seven slots instead of five. Did they all equip? One, two, three, four, five spells. Yep. Plus all of our special... her standard ones. Good. All right. Good. 